Alhamdulillah, the uh, modern man today has an obsession in his pursuit for this ideal that people call hurriyah or freedom, liberty. In every aspect of society, in recent times at least, there has been revolutions, upheavals, uprisals that have affected every aspect of society, starting with governments and civic life, permeating to arts, culture, literature, You've heard of the Enlightenment movement. You've heard of rationalist ideas. You've studied it in school. You've heard of modern philosophical thought. All of this is in pursuit of what? Is in pursuit of this ideal that people call freedom. To be at liberty. To not be constrained or limited by any aspect of life. To be free. But we find ourselves asking the questions, particularly as Muslims, to what extent has the modern man achieved this goal, this ideal of, of being hur, of being free? Is he truly a free man today in the 21st century? When you, hand, when you had Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the Genevan philosopher, whose ideas in political science and philosophy affected the West a lot in their ideas, when he was lighting the torches of freedom. His ideas and his theorizing was affecting every aspect of Western society. During the same time, the same societies were ravaging other communities across the globe in the name of freedom. At a time when here in the West we were talking about freedom, other societies were being turned upside down. Africans were being hunted in certain parts of the world by the very same communities who were talking at home about freedom and equality. During that time, they were being hunted. Colonies built in their ruins. And those who remained alive amongst them were brought back in cages to serve the colonizer in North America and other parts of the West. And amazingly, all of this was happening in the name of what? It was happening in the name of freedom. With this backdrop and this short introduction, I shift your attention to a story that I think most of you have come across at one point or another. When Amr ibn al-As, the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was governor of Egypt, his son, the son of the authority, took part in a horse race against another Qipti, meaning a Coptic boy of Egypt. The son of the governor won the race. So he was upset, so he picked up a whip and he hit the boy, relying on his father's authority, knowing that the kid would not be able to hit back. So the young Coptic boy complained to his dad and his dad was aggrieved and he traveled where? To the city of Medina in search of who? Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu, the caliph of the Muslims, in search for justice. Umar was devastated when he heard this news, that a Muslim had assaulted a Coptic because he was relying on his dad's power. So Umar ibn al-Khattab wrote a letter to Amr ibn al-As saying to him, as per what follows the moment you read this letter, you come to me, you and your son, to the city of Medina. Amr ibn al-As packs his bag, he arrives in Medina. And when all of them were now in front of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar, Amr ibn al-As, his son, the Coptic boy, and his father, Umar hands over a whip to the Coptic boy, and he says to him, if you wish, you can hit the child or the kid that hit you. And so he, uh, he cashed that check. And he took the whip and he began to hit the boy, hit the boy, until he felt as if retribution had been delivered. He felt good. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab said to the boy, لو ضربت عمر ابن العاص لما منعتك أن الغلام إنما ضربك استنادا على ملك أبيه. Subhanallah. Umar said to him, 
young man, if you wanted to hit his father, if you wanted to, hit, to whip his dad, Amr ibn al-As, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, I wouldn't have stopped you because his son only hit you relying on his authority. And then Umar, he turns to the governor of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As, and he said to him those phenomenal words that you have come across. He said to him, Since when have you taken people as slaves when their mothers bore them as free? La ilaha illallah. The famous statement that we've all come across. When have you taken people? Since when have you decided to take people as slaves? When their mothers bore them free. The events in Palestine, and specifically in Gaza, since 2023, late 2023 till this day, have sharpened the distinctions between things that were already separate. The events in Palestine have drawn clear lines between the worlds of dunya and the akhirah. Those who pursue this material world and those who are pursuing the hereafter. It's made it clearer than ever before. They've drawn clear lines between the realms of dhulm, injustice, and adil justice. They have drawn clear lines between the worlds of cowardice and courage. And truth and hypocrisy. And they've also drawn very clear lines between the worlds of, and focus on this one, the worlds of enslavement and what it means to truly be free. Do you agree? When the Arabs speak of the word hurriya, freedom, which is used a lot, especially today, and they describe someone as being hur, meaning free, what do they mean? There are two usages. The first usage, memorize it, is the idea of being free from physical bondage. When they say that such and such person is hur, this person is free, it means that they are not in physical captivity. Their status is that of a free person. His status is not a slave. He is hur, they say. And this is a goal, of course, that Islam aspires towards. The jurists, the fuqaha, they say, Al-Islam Islam inclines towards freedom. It aspires towards freedom. It incentivizes freedom. In fact, Islam considers slavery as tantamount to death. And it considers freedom as tantamount to life. And that is why the atonement, the kafara, the expiation of accidental killing is what? The freeing of a slave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأَ فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنًا Whoever kills a believing soul accidentally, then the kafara, the atonement, is to free a believing slave. What's the relationship? You will say. And Nasafi, the Quranic interpreter, said, the relationship is clear. Because the killer had accidentally transferred somebody from the realms of the living to the realms of the dead, the kafara, the expiation, is to reintegrate into life someone who is dead, to bring someone from the dead back into the life. How do you do that? By taking someone who doesn't have his freedom or her freedom and bring them back into the living, i.e. give them freedom. So this is how Islam sees what? The idea of Freedom, and which meaning are we referring to here? The freedom from physical bondage, captivity, your status as a slave or as a free person. Islam aspires to create freedom. That is meaning number one. Usage number two. When the Arabs, they say so-and-so is hur or free, they mean that this is a person who is honored with lofty characteristics and high and noble values. When they see a person who has elevated himself or herself from the base traits, the lowly characteristics, and they become men or women of bravery, courage, generosity, feeding of the guest, honoring of the family, people of virtue who stay away from what is prohibited and despicable, they look at that person and they say, that person is free. 
That's a new concept. That's a new understanding. So do you see how the Islamic or the Arabic understanding of freedom is quite different to how we understand it here in the West? Do whatever you want. Our understanding of freedom is very much connected with the idea of duty, connected with the idea of responsibility, connected with the idea of morality, adab, akhlaq, generosity. They say that is a person who is free. And that is why the Arabic linguist, Ibn Manzur al-Afriqi, he said, Al-Hurr huwa al hasan Al-Hurr, meaning something that is free, it refers to doing what is fine. Doing what is fine. They say that is free. And in the feminine form, Al-Hurratu, with a ta marbuta, in the feminine form, they say it means Al-Karimatu min nisa the honorable woman. So when the Arab looks at a woman who is honorable, they say she is hurrah, she is truly free. It's a paradigm shift. Which type of freedom does Islam aspire to achieve? This one or this one that I have defined? Both. Islam aspires to achieve them both. I want to take you now on a very quick tour of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I would like to show you how the Quran endeavors to free humanity from the constraints of life and to make them only accountable ultimately to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to understand freedom through the light of Ubudiyah to understand freedom, liberty through the light of being a abd, a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how does the Quran seek to remove the shackles from our wrists and our necks and the yokes from our body number one the Qur'an seeks to liberate man, this is an example, from untamed desires. Desires that have no limitations. The Qur'an wants to free you from that. The Qur'an acknowledges that the const constant tug of war between you and desire, myself and desire, this is endless till the day we die. That doesn't leave us. We're constantly being pulled left, right, and center by our urges and our quirks and our yearnings. The Qur'an acknowledges this. But what the Qur'an will not tolerate is that for man to be enslaved to these things, forever craving, forever yearning, forever wanting more, always wanting to see what's on the other side of the fence, wanting to explore, never satisfied, never content. The Qur'an does not want to see a person enslaved in this way, so it liberates him. How does the Qur'an liberate man from untamed desires? The Qur'an will say, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ثَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Anything that you've been given today, it's just the temporary enjoyment of this world. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى But what is with Allah is better and far more enduring. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Will you not reason? The Qur'an will say, قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ The enjoyment of life is little. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى And the hereafter is better for those who have piety. Allahu Akbar. So the Qur'an does not want you to be conquered by your desires, it wants you to conquer them. It doesn't want you to be controlled by your desires, it wants you to be free so that you are the one who controls them. The Qur'an seeks to liberate you and I from untamed desires. Number two, the Qur'an seeks to liberate man from being a blind follower. The Qur'an does not accept to see man behaving like a sheep, a mu'min behaving like sheep. Following the latest trend, following the latest dictates of society, handing over your mind and your personality to a friend or a lobby or even a government or a family member, a blind follower. The Quran does not accept that you are enslaved to blind conformity. It wants you to have a mind of your own, to have some autonomy, to be an independent believer who was steered by way of wahi revelation not controlled by the revelations of man. And you see it today, especially perhaps some of the teenagers who have an absolute obsession with being liked. A constant desire to be in the good books of everyone, to please everyone, to make everyone happy. The fear of falling out of grace with anyone. 
And what you end up seeing with a lot of our young ones particularly is that with the passage of time, because of their obsession of being liked, they end up developing multiple personalities. Personality for mom and dad, a, per a personality for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a, a personality for the boyfriend or the girlfriend, a personality for the street, personality for the business, personality for the internet. And then with the passage of time, because you're you now lost in all of these personalities, you end up forgetting who you are. You lose your own personality. So the Qur'an wants man to be liberated from being a blind follower and to stand his or her ground. The Qur'an said, liberating you and I from this, يَوْمَ تُقَلَّبُ وُجُوهُهُمْ فِي النَّارِ يَقُولُونَ يَا لَيْتَنَا أَطَعْنَ اللَّهَ وَأَطَعْنَ الرَّسُولَ On the day when their faces will be turned upside down, left and right, in the hellfire, as they roast, and they will say, Oh, we wish that we had followed Allah and His Messenger. And then they will say, وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّا أَطَعْنَا سَادَتَنَا وَكُبَرَاءَنَا فَأَضَلُّونَ السَّبِيلَ Oh, our Lord, they will cry in the fire. Oh, our Lord, we followed our masters and we followed our dignitaries, but they misled us. رَبَّنَا آتِهِمْ ضِعْفَيْنِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ وَالْعَنْهُمْ لَعْنًا كَبِيرًا So, oh Allah, give them double the punishment and curse them a great cursing. Allahu Akbar. There they are, roasting in the fire, complaining, Oh Allah, we had followed them. We were blind followers. We wish we didn't do that. So beware, my brother, my sister, of being a person who today is so obsessed in the approval of others, even though it may come at the expense of your deen, then the same people who you had sold your hereafter for, you end up cursing them in Jahannam and asking Allah to multiply the punishment upon them. So what have we said so far? The Qur'an seeks to liberate man from being controlled and enslaved by haram desire. The Qur'an seeks to liberate man from what? Being a blind follower. Number three, the Qur'an seeks to liberate man from poverty anxiety. There are very few things out there that cause a person to stay up at night more than the fear of job insecurity and how you're going to provide for your family or for yourself tomorrow. And perhaps one of the quickest ways of being able to subjugate a community and control them is by threatening them by way of what? By way of their provisions, their rizq. So poverty anxiety is real. And the Quran does not tolerate man to be a slave to money and reminds him that your risk, your provisions is not controlled by any mortal on the face of the earth. How does the Quran liberate you from this fear? Read with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Say to them, Who is the one who provides for you from the heavens and the earth? Who is the one who controls your hearing and your seeing? وَمَنْ يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ And who is the one who brings the living from the dead and brings the dead from the living? وَمَنْ يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرِ Who is the one who controls the entire affair? فَسَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهِ They will say, it is Allah. فَقُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ So reply to them, will you therefore not fear him? So the Qur'an demolishes this idea that any man or any government or any employer or any supplier is the one who controls your provisions. The Qur'an liberates you from the fear of poverty and reminds you, never has bravery shortened the life of a person and never has cowardice extended his life. That's number three. The Qur'an seeks to liberate you from poverty and anxiety. And number four, the Qur'an seeks to liberate you and I from the fear of death. What is there a greater pressure? What more of a pressure is there in life than the dread of dying or the dread of being killed and the cling to life? One of the easiest ways of manipulating a person or a family or a society is by threatening them, we will drop bombs on you, you will die either through the air or through hunger or by the closing of the borders or whatever it may be. The quickest and easiest ways 
usually to extract a concession from a people and to cause them to just toe the line is to threaten them with what? With death. And the Quran does not accept that man should be enslaved by the fear of death. And how does the Quran liberate you from this fear? By saying, وَمَا كَانَ لِنَفْسٍ أَن تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ كِتَابًا مُؤَجَّلًا It is not for any soul to die except by the permission of Allah. At a time decreed by Him, no man could bring that forward or push it back. So do you see through this very quick tour how the Qur'an, there are many examples we could have given, it makes hurriya with the understanding that we defined earlier through your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how the Qur'an seeks to make the objective of freedom central in its ayat. And this is why with this understanding of freedom, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the freest of all of Allah's creation on earth. A man who would carry himself with immense self-respect and dignity even before he became a prophet. A man who, was, who had a mind of his own, who never allowed a lobby or a government or a tribe or a society or a friend or a family member to dictate his mind, to govern his personality, to control him. He was a man who was independent in his thought, independent in his personality and character. It wasn't an open check for people to write in whatever they want. He was not a man who would take the color of whatever friend he would walk with. He was a man who was truly free. And that is why he wasn't afraid to draw a line between himself and the prevalent practices in Mecca. He wasn't afraid to say, no, I don't do this. Though all of society were against him at one point. Bowing to idols was commonplace. Drinking alcohol was commonplace. Using interest, riba was commonplace. Female infanticide, burying your daughter alive, was to some extent commonplace. He wasn't afraid to say, I don't do any of this stuff, though it is the status quo of my community. Why? Because he was free. Then when Allah Jalla Jalaluhu gave him prophethood, and he became a true abd of Allah, a true worshipper of Allah, through his ubudiyah, through his worship of Allah, his freedom reached a whole new level. And he wanted to impart these meanings of freedom through Islam onto the hearts of the men and women who were around him. Why? So that they could never be conquered. So that they were immovable in their faith. So that they could never be bought with money. They couldn't be purchased with assets. They couldn't be tempted with the other's agenda. Men and women who were free, what steered them, what controlled them, what guided them was revelation and revelation alone. That is the true meaning of freedom. And I'm going to share with you three or four very quick stories that beautifully demonstrate the signs of a person who is truly free through their behavior. Example number one belongs to a young boy called Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Abdullah, son of Az-Zubair. Az-Zubair, of course, his father, who was one of the ten promised Jannah. And his mother, Asma, daughter of Abu Bakr. So no, it's no surprise that Abdullah would be the, the fruit of this beautiful marriage. Abdullah ibn Zubair, as a child, was playing with a group of his friends in the street when Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu walks past. And you know Umar radiallahu anhu and his haybah, his awe, even before he became a caliph, khalifa. So imagine what happened when he became khalifa. Umar, he passes by, and the kids just rush. They scurry. They go into hiding. With the exception to this one kid, Abdullah ibn Zubair, he stands his ground. So Umar is fascinated by this. So he goes to the young boy, and he says to him, how come you didn't run away with the rest of your friends? Abdullah ibn Zubair, he said to him the following words. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, O leader of the believers, Lam akun ala ribatin min amri fa akhafuk, wa lam yakun it tariku tayyikan fa usi'ulak. He said, Leader of the believers, uh, I haven't done anything wrong such that I should fear you. And the path is quite wide. I don't think I need to make space for you. La ilaha illallah. Umar radiallahu anhu was amazed when he saw this. 
Because in front, of him, in front of him was a young man who was not afraid of authority. Particularly when his conscience was clear. In other words, you had a child who was not enslaved by fear. Omar was impressed. That's example number one. Story number two. Hakim ibn Hizam is the name of the nephew of our mother Khadija radiyallahu anha. And once when he was walking through the marketplaces, he stumbled across the robe of the king of Yemen that was being sold. The king of Yemen who was known as Dhu Yazin. And so he offered a few dinars of gold. He purchased the royal robe. He came to the city of Medina and he gifted it to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he wore it and he delivered a sermon like this wearing the robe of the king Dhu Yazin. And then he came down from the pulpit and he took it off because this is not really the dress of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And he clothed it to a young man called Usama ibn Zayd. Usama son of Zayd. Who was he? The ex-adopted son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam who unfortunately occupied quite a low position in the social hierarchy. He gave him the robe of Dhu Yazin. And so Hakim ibn Hizam who bought the robe originally he saw this young boy wearing the robe of the king of Yemen and he said to him, Usama ibn Zayd, wearing the robe of the king of Yemen? And Usama ibn Zayd, he said, Naam, la ana wallahi khayrun min the yazin, wa la abi khayrun min abihi. He said, yeah, I am wearing the robe of the king of Yemen because I am better than the king of Yemen. He said, and my dad is better than the dad of the king of Yemen. Allahu Akbar. Hakim ibn Hizam was amazed when he heard this. Why was he amazed? Because in front of him was a young man who was free. Free from all of the metrics that you and I use to measure people. Clothes and cars and homes and money and women and the rest of it. A boy who didn't believe in any of that stuff. That my value comes through my piety my taqwa, my worship to Allah, and it doesn't matter what society thinks. I am better than the king of the Yazin, and my dad is better than his dad. Allahu Akbar. Example number three, and I think you've also come across this example at least, an event that took place just before the Persian Empire collapsed at the hands of the Muslims. The Battle of Al-Qadisiyah was about to take place, led, of course, by Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas during the time of Amir al-Mu'mideen Umar. And the general of the Persian armies by the name of Rustum wanted to speak to a delegate of the Muslims to understand what are they doing? What are they trying to achieve? These are the people who we used to give them peas and pennies, right? And they would go away as Arabs before Islam. And now they're coming to take my throne? So he says, send me a delegate to speak to. So who did they nominate? They nominated, what's his name? What's his name? Huh? Rab'i ibn Amir. Rab'i ibn Amir. A man who was described in the books of history as being quite short. There was nothing grand about him. He wore the simplest of clothes and he had no very impressive, he didn't have an impressive physique either. He was quite thin. But guess what? He was a mu'min who was free. That's why they nominated him. So Rabbi ibn Amr, he comes on his mule, his donkey, and the guards of Rustam, they say, you can't speak to the uh, leader on the mule, get off. He said, I'm not gonna get off my mule because you asked to speak to us, we didn't ask to speak to you. So Rustam said, let him in. So he's coming in now to the, into the royal court of uh, Rustam. And he has with him his spear and he's, he's stabbing at the expensive Persian carpets in front of Rustam. As if to say, none of this means anything to us. Trying to impress us. And he's ripping it apart. And Rustam looks at Rabai and he says to him, Man antum? Wa man ladhi jaabikum? Who are you? Who are the Muslims? What brings you here to our land? What does Rabai say? and link it to the topic of our talk this afternoon. He said to him, نحن قوم, we are a people. Yeah? What is your bio? 
This is your bio. He said, Nahnu qawmun, we are a people. Ibtaathan Allah, sent by Allah. لنخرج العباد من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد sent by Allah Almighty to remove people from the worship of each other to the worship of Allah ومن جور الأديان إلى عدل الإسلام and to remove people from the injustices of religions to the justice of Islam ومن ضيق الدنيا إلى ساعة الدنيا والآخرة and to remove people from the limitations of life to the expanse of the hereafter. By the end of the conversation, and it was a long dialogue, Rustum was amazed. And he said to Rabbi, Sayyiduhum Ant, are you the leader of the Muslims? Like, are you their prophet and messenger? Are you their master? And he said to him, essentially, no, I'm not their master, but as Muslims, uh, we can speak for one another at any level of the society. So Rustum was amazed at the sight of a man who was free. And the last story I share with you pertains to a judge by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baqillani. He is a Ash'ari scholar who lived around 950 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. And he was summoned to engage in a theological debate with one of the emperors of Rome, who was a Christian. The emperor of Rome is thinking to himself, how am I going to get this man to bow to me? Because it was the custom of the emperors of Rome that when you come into their royal space, you prostrate, you kiss the floor, and then you speak to the emperor. He knows that he's not going to get this from Judge Abu Bakr. So what is he to do? He said to his men, bring down the height of the door. So instead of it being seven foot high, bring it down to say, four foot high, which means that when he comes into my space, he has to bow down, and so we get it out of him that way. So Judge Abu Bakr al-Baqillani arrives at the palace of the emperor. The emperor is told the judge has arrived, and so he establishes his throne in front of this shortened door. Judge Abu Bakr arrives, and he sees that the door has been shortened, and he understands the ploy. So what does he do? Well, he only turns 180 degrees, and I'm not going to demonstrate out of respect to you. He turns 180 degrees and gives the door his back. And then he bows down. And then he comes in in reverse, giving the king his backside. And then he stands back up facing the wall, adjusts his headgear and his clothes, and then he turns and he speaks to the king. And the king was amazed when he saw this. And he realized that these Muslims can never be enslaved. These three stories are images and narrations. I want you to remember the next time a friend or a trend or society ex expectation suggests that you should be lesser of a practicing Muslim, be a slave of us rather than being a abd of Allah. Remember these stories, load them up in your mind. So. This image of Abu Bakr al-Baqillani giving the emperor essentially his backside because he was a man who wanted to detract from his freedom as a mu'min, as a believer in Allah. That's the image I want you to load up in your mind every time you come across a situation in your life when someone wants to take you down their path and detract from your freedom, i.e. your ubudiyya to Allah Almighty and make them a slave to them and their way. That's the image you should think about at the family level or the social level, the financial level, any pressure that comes your way to detract from who you are as a mu'min, load up this image of Abu Bakr al-Baqillani because they don't deserve anything more than this. So with that said, I come to the latter parts of this talk and we ask the question, what are the signs of the people who are free? We've defined freedom according to our understanding and how it is linked to duty and ubudiyah and worship to Allah. I've given you examples from the people of the past who behaved in a way of true freedom. And now we come to the theory and we ask the question, what are the marks of the people of Hurriya? What are their signs? So that when you see them, you recognize them. And so that you can act upon these principles as well. 
And so that when somebody says, I'm free to do what I want, you understand whether they are truly a free person or just another slave to yet another idol. What are the signs? What are the hallmarks? What are the defining features of people, individuals, or communities who are truly free? Number one, a free person is an individual or a people who never hand over their minds or their personalities to be governed and dictated to by others. They have a mind of, an own, of their own. And there is some autonomy in their behavior. And they know how to say no, though everyone around them may be saying yes. They know how to say no, these are my limits. Not as an act of defiance or stubbornness, but to declare their autonomy that as a mu'min, as a believer in Allah, I have my independence to worship Him. He's freed me from all of these dictates. You know how to say no. You know how to draw the line, though the pressures may be phenomenal. And when you stay away, as a free person, when you stay away from what is prohibited, haram, it's not just because it is haram that you stay away from it. It's not just because it's going to bring you sin. It's because you as a free person fundamentally feel that the sin is beneath you. You are above it. This sin that you're asking me to do, this dress that you're requiring of me, this product you want me to sell, this financial entanglement that I don't agree with, this thing doesn't suit me. It may suit you or may suit them. It doesn't fit who I am as a believer who has been liberated through Islam. It doesn't work for me. That's sign number one. They don't hand over their minds and their personalities to be governed and dictated to by others. Take note of sign number two of a people who are truly ahrar, truly free. They don't allow fallouts between them and another Muslim to extend unnecessarily long. Whether it's between you and a cousin, you and an ex-spouse, or you and an ex-business partner, you or a relative, you don't allow a fallout to prolong a period of silence that drags. You don't allow a relationship to be strained for so long because you're free from all of these impulses. You don't arrogantly say, he must apologize to me before I give them the apology. They must extend the olive branch before I do. You don't do that. My sister, my brother, you don't deprive an ex-spouse from access to their children and custody to their children. Why? Because you are free. You are above these impulses. You are above egoism and impatience and recklessness. You're not steered and governed by recklessness and anger and rage and pettiness and bitterness you're free from all of that that is a sign of a person who is free sign number two sign number three a person who is truly free will never opt to make an income from that which is haram they are not enslaved to the lobby whatever it may be or the supplier or the employer I will never make an income as a free believer through that which is prohibited. Because you know through your aqidah, your belief, that what is meant for you will come your way. No one can stop it. And what is not meant to be on your plate can never come to you, though the world may try to bring it to you. So you're at rest. You're at peace. Never will you add to your capital through that which is prohibited or doubtful. That is another sign of those who are free. And though they may see people driving high-end cars and living in luxurious homes, if that money was sourced from haram, you see it for what it is. That's a slave in that car. That's a slave in that apartment or house. And though you may be living in a very small property and driving a very basic car, if that money has come from the halal, that is the image of a man who is free, who is truly at liberty. Sign number three of those who are truly free is that they inspire an immense level of awe. Their character, their personalities, their behavior, their decisions, 
their talk, their silence is magnetic. There is an enchanting charm to their behavior. Because Allah Almighty created you and I as free and honorable people, we recognize honor when we see it. That is sign number three. When you see those who are truly free, you are amazed. There is an irresistible pull towards them and you can't explain it, but I explain it to you, my brother, my sister. You are witnessing a man or a woman or a community who are truly free. Though it may cost them their lives, they stand by their principles and that is a spectacle that we admire. Perhaps this explains why the events in Palestine and Gaza specifically have captured the attention of the world. Maybe it was their patience. I don't think it's their patience. We've seen patience before. Maybe it's their resilience, their stubbornness, their optimism. We've seen optimism elsewhere. Maybe it's their bravery and their courage. We've seen courage elsewhere. I argue, and Allah knows best, that the secret behind how the world has been enchanted by the behavior of those patient Muslims there in Palestine goes back to this element that we're speaking of this evening. We admire freedom when we see it. And we recognize freedom when we see it. And we are drawn and pulled towards freedom when we see it. And that is what we have seen there. And that is what the world has seen. And perhaps you have come across the article in the Guardian newspaper that was titled, and I quote word for word, young Americans picking up copies of the Quran to understand Muslim Palestinian resilience. Trying to understand how is it that they behave in this way? It's costing them everything that you and I consider dear, yet it's nothing is too much to sacrifice for Allah Almighty. In short, sign number three, you will recognize a person or a community who are truly free because you are innately drawn to their behavior. Why? because their freedom is anchored upon something very high. Their freedom is not anchored upon desire, fetishes, urges, impulses. Their freedom is anchored upon the most high Allah Jalla Jalalu, and for them, nothing is too much to sacrifice for him. Sean King, American journalist, another man who recognized the freedom of the people of Palestine and he decided, he decided to become like them and to embrace their religion. He credited on the first day of the month of Ramadan when he took his shahada there in America, he categorically credited his reversion to Islam to the last six months of scenes that he has seen unfolding in Gaza and the resilience of the Muslims there. He said, if it wasn't for those last six months, I don't think I would be here today. He said, not only have they opened my eyes and the eyes of my wife, who are here to become Muslims, but they have opened the eyes of millions across the world as well. That is sign number three, when you see a person who is free, they garner an immense sense of awe in your heart and respect you want to be like them. All of the da'wah that we've been giving and all of the information we've been sharing about Islam. Alhamdulillah, I mean, this is great. It, it mustn't stop. Don't get me wrong. This is part of our religion. But the paradigm shift happened where? When did the trajectory do this? When freedom was displayed. When the Quran was put on show. Though it may cost me my life, I have principles that I live and die upon. You can achieve the same results on the people you work with, your family, your children. The community who rubs shoulders with you. You can have the exact same effect on them. Though you may not memorize a lot of Quran and Hadith, and maybe you're not very clear in your talk, maybe you don't have a vast vocab. But just you demonstrating Islam, just you showing how your values, you believe them to reign supreme whenever there is a conflict, standing to your principles when there is a, a tension, that in of itself is to draw, is enough to draw the awe of the people who you mix with towards the religion that you profess. Brothers and sisters, I want to also say to you something very important as we come to the end now of the lecture, and that is, Alhamdulillah, all of us are going around saying, free Palestine, free Palestine. The, the word free Palestine has now reverberated across the entire globe. Great, Alhamdulillah, noble statement, I'm not there to bash it. 
We all want to free Palestine. But it's key for us to realize that in order for our activism to free Palestine, to flourish, we need to be people who are free ourselves. فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِيهِ The Arabs say. One who doesn't possess something can't offer it to others. I can't go to a people and remove the shackles from their wrists if there are shackles restraining me. I cannot take the straight jacket off the body of a person if there is a straight jacket on me. If I am enslaved by something, then I cannot deliver freedom to others though I may chant free, free Palestine all day and all night. And that is why we have the story of Antar ibn Shaddad, the famous Arab African pre-Islamic poet and knight who we have immortalized in our books of literature in the Arab world. Antar ibn Shaddad was born a child who had a color that his father didn't appreciate, unfortunately. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. So his father decided to not give him his surname and to deprive him from paternity. And this broke the heart of heart of young Antara. Until a tribe came and invaded the tribe of Antara on one evening, the tribe of Abs, and they stole all of the camels. So the father of Antar ibn Shaddad, he said to his son, Ya Antar, kur, Ya Antar, go and proceed, charge at them, charge, go and fight Antara. Antara said to his dad, he said, Dad, slaves like us don't know how to charge and fight. We only know how to milk animals and herd sheep. So his father realized, I was the one who made him into a coward. I have deprived him from his right of paternity. I have not given him my surname. So his father knew what he needed to do. He said, Kurya antara wa antahur. Charge antara and I will give you your freedom. So Antara charged, and he fought them single-handedly in a ferocious battle, and he retrieved the camels, and he became Antara ibn Shaddad, whom we celebrate till this day. What is the point of mentioning this story? Antara was only able to do what he did, when what? He was free himself. So you look into the mirror of your life, my brother, my sister, very carefully, and be honest with yourself. I know you want to free Palestine. Jazakallahu khairan. I don't doubt that. Alhamdulillah. And I know that you want to give everything that you possess for the cause. And you feel that you wish you could do a lot more than you're doing today. But before your efforts can be truly effective, let's not deceive ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves. Let's be real. I have to be free before I can free anyone else. Look into the mirror of your life. What are the shackles that exist on your limbs. Is it, for example, uh, an enslavement to prohibited types of browsing on the internet that you're still struggling with till this day in the month of Ramadan? Those shackles need to come off before you can help others shake off theirs. Is it my sister, a hijab, that you have been embattled with for so many years? This is the time now to don the perfect hijab as described by the legislator to shake off those shackles before you can help others do the same? Is it perhaps an obsession with what people think of you? An obsession with being liked by others regardless of what it costs you? Friends, family, nieces, nephews, parents, and above all Allah Almighty and your religion? Shake off those shackles, my brother, my sister, before you can help others do the same. What are your shackles? You think about it. You think about your life and I do the same. Is it a financial dealing that you know is shady to say the least? So my brother and my sister, I know that perhaps this is a bit of a daunting way to end the talk. This is the way to support our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Let me say, this is a way of supporting our brothers and sisters in Palestine. By engaging in introspection and beginning with yourself, before your activism can become effective. And a lot of us will ask the question, what is, what is Ramadan? What was Ramadan with the backdrop of Gaza? It was so difficult. 
seeing all that brutality and cruelty every day coming through our feed. What was Ramadan? And what is Ramadan with all of this happening in the background? I say to you, this is the best Ramadan of your life. It must be the best Ramadan of your life. When your process to individual freedom started with Gaza six months ago, and inshallah will be completed by the end of the month of Ramadan. Say inshallah, inshallah. It started then, it will end inshallah in two, three days. On the day of Eid, we declare to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have been freed. We have been freed from every pressure, every constraint, every limitation, and we are only accountable and governed by wahi, by ubudiyah, wa worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad, alhamdulillah, rabbil